Welcome everyone to Adding the Brain to the Education Equation. It is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Howard Eaton, the founder and director of Eaton Aerosmith, who will be introducing our main speaker this evening, Barbara Aerosmith Young. Thank you, Sandra. And what a delight to have Barbara uh, with us today. Uh, I haven't seen Barbara face to face for years now uh, because of the pandemic. So it's just wonderful seeing her and it's an honor to follow her extraordinary career. Uh, I first heard of Barbara's work decades ago, over 20 years ago now. Uh, I was a, a teacher, uh, instructor at the University of British Columbia, uh, teaching courses on learning disabilities uh, to teachers in training. Uh, and I was in the paradigm that learning disabilities are, are lifelong, that cognitive weaknesses are lifelong. And so when her work came to my attention, I was extremely curious about who this woman was because she defied the field of learning disabilities in terms of what was considered uh, sort of normal practice. Uh, fortunately, I had an open mind. I had a chance to have coffee with her and a friend in downtown Vancouver, again, over 20 years ago. And her intelligence, uh, her modesty, her, her insight into the field of learning disabilities was extraordinary. And I had a chance to visit her school in Toronto, again, over 20 years ago, and talk with the teachers, talk with the parents, and talk with the students, more importantly. And I began to understand the transformation that she was providing these children and adults with learning disabilities. And I was fortunate enough to have the privilege to start a school in Vancouver, uh, Canada, on the campus of the University of British Columbia, and begin to see what this work means to students uh, upfront and personal uh, as a principal and then the director of the school. We've had over 1,500 students, Barbara, go through our program. It's unbelievable. And I am still shocked at the stories of transformation and success post Eaton Aerosmith that I hear. Uh, and, um, you know, it's just a, an amazing opportunity to work with you. I've met two other people that have transformed my life and my career. Uh, one was Diana Hambury King, who was an Orton Gillingham expert, dyslexia expert. And I had the privilege to work with her uh, at her school, at the Kildonan School in Camp Thunabeck, and become an Orton Gillingham tutor and work with children with dyslexia, teaching them phonics. She was one of my uh, first sort of remarkable uh, inspirations. And then another person, Dr. Lauren Brinkerhoff, who was in charge of the Learning Disability Support Program at Boston University, where he was trying to transform services and accommodations to, to young st students at Boston University. Uh, and then the third and most important person in my life, in my field, has been you, Barbara. And you have given me remarkable insight and awareness into neurological functioning, into learning disabilities, attention disorders, and cognitive transformation through the work that you're doing. So again, it's just an honor to be with you. You, you, uh, you your, your work is now moving into the field of brain injury, which is exciting. So your work is transferring, not just to adults and children with learning disabilities and attention disorders, uh, but individuals with brain injury as well. And so it's a, a delight to have you. Uh, I wish I could talk about you forever, but I know people want to listen to you. So uh, off the, uh, on to you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. I really, really appreciate that uh, introduction. And wow, 20 years, it's uh, just kind of almost feels like uh, yesterday in some ways. And I just really want to thank um, the, the team at Eaton Aerosmith uh, Schools for inviting me to talk about what I'm most passionate about uh, this evening. And I want to thank everybody for coming to listen to me talk about what I'm most passionate about, which is the human brain and its incredible capacity for change. And if, if we think about our brain, it really does drive behavior. It shapes who we are. Um, and as we know, this concept of neuroplasticity that our brain can uh, change and develop and um, grow across our lifespan. So if we think about, um, 
you know, what the vision of this work is. And I think there are slides somewhere there. Uh, Okay, um, so the, the next slide is, is on our the vision, which certainly is the vision of Aerosmith program, and it's the vision of uh, Eaton Aerosmith. It's really to transform lives worldwide by improving cognitive capacities. And I often kind of imagine what would the world be like if um, we had the opportunity to do this, which is what we are doing through our work and what is happening in the classrooms at Eaton Aerosmith. And if people know Norman Doidge and, and his work, um, he wrote the book, The Brain That Changes Itself uh, and The Brain's uh, Way of Healing. And he comments about the benefits of our work. And he says, the fact that Aerosmith trains the brain processors that make possible reasoning and rationality is arguably one of the most important positive developments we could imagine for our world and its complex problems. Um, and there have been numerous think tanks over the past 20 years, they've posed the question, how do we prepare students today for an uncertain world where we can't predict the types of jobs that might be required? And to me, and to the team at Eaton Aerosmith, the answer is simple, we prepare their brains. Uh, the next slide shows some work that the World Economic Forum has done. They've identified 16 skills that they say are critical for the 21st century. And any, every single one of these skills, if we, we look at these curiosity, initiative, persistence, uh, literacy across a number of, of academic disciplines, all of these can be positively enhanced by our cognitive programs. So we argue you change the brain, you change cognition, you change learning, you change the acquisition of academic skills, and you change social emotional well being. And the end result of this is a brain that is honed to reason, to think critically, to collaborate with others and their ideas, to be curious to be adaptable and agile, to meet novel challenges, to be empathetic, to generate creative solutions, to have mental initiative, and to have the grit and persistent to, persistence to see plans to fruition. So our brain is our greatest asset. And we know how to harness this asset through the principles of neuroplasticity. And the next slide just talks about this concept. So really neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to change. Uh, we know we can grow dendrites in the brain. We can make new connections. We can strengthen existing connections. We can actually grow new neurons in our brain. And through this, we can fundamentally change the brain's capacity to learn and to function. And this can happen throughout the lifespan. And we have worked with people as young as age five. And I think the oldest person that we've worked with, I think it was Eaton Aerosmith, I think they were 85. Uh, so to me, it's promising as I'm getting a little older that there still is neuroplasticity, hopefully in this brain of mine. And our brains are designed for lifelong learning to flexibly adapt and meet novel challenges. And this is now understood and accepted. So what is Aerosmith? It's a capacity-based program. And really it's very different from traditional education. And what do we mean by capacity-based program? It means that we can change fundamentally the capacity of the learner to learn through applying the principles of neuroplasticity. So we're not teaching content, we're not teaching skills, we're not providing compensations or workarounds. Our goal is to fundamentally change the capacity of the learner to learn which then allows learning to proceed with ease, with joy and with efficiency. So again, our underlying premise is change the brain, change cognitive capacity, change academic outcomes, change social emotional well-being, and fundamentally transform the future of the learner. So if we think about that we each have our own unique cognitive profile and over the past 40 years, I've come to understand the importance of this. So if we each think about our own learning process, we can all identify areas where we excel and other areas where maybe there's some challenges or that we tend to avoid. Maybe we don't have a good spatial sense and we tend to get lost or we don't pick up languages easily or maybe we miss subtle social cues. And underpinning these abilities is our unique cognitive profile of strengths and areas of challenge. And in most cases, we can work around these challenges and they don't really have a significant impact on our lives. 
A learning difficulty or learning disability occurs when there's what we call a cognitive load, which means that there's a significant number of cognitive weaknesses or difficulties that come together to make certain aspects of learning challenging. And I've learned that there's explanatory value in looking at behavior through a cognitive lens, that understanding an individual's unique profile can help provide insight into and explain a lot of behavior. So some examples, we can think of individuals that we know who are unable to benefit from insight. They really can't connect cause and effect. And so they can't really develop insight into their own behavior. And in this, these cases, it's not due to a psychological problem, it's due to a cognitive issue. Or sometimes people get labeled as stubborn or rigid. And this may be due to a cognitive difficulty in not being able to see and consider an alternative way of viewing a situation. I had this challenge and throughout my schooling was labeled as being rigid and stubborn. And again, it was cognitive. Or someone who doesn't follow instructions may not be defiant, but they may have an auditory memory problem and can't retain what they've been asked to do. So if people are interested, there is a cognitive profile questionnaire on the Eaton Aerosmith website, also on our website, that if you answer the questions either for yourself or for your child, it will generate a report looking at your cognitive profile of strengths and weaknesses. So I really encourage people um, to look at that because it gives insight into um, one's strengths and weaknesses or one's child's strengths and weaknesses. And the first step to addressing any kind of learning difficulty or learning challenge first is to identify that cognitive profile because we go under the label. So we go under the label of dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia to understand what are the cognitive um, difficulties or cognitive areas of challenge that are leading to that diagnostic label. So again, we recognize that each cognitive area requires its own specific cognitive program to strengthen that function. And what are some of these functions? On um, the next slide, um, we look at uh, these and they work on a continuum. And this is what makes it really interesting. So you can have an area that's functioning at an exceptionally strong level. It can be in a superior level, it can be average or a function could be a mild, moderate, or severe level of, of difficulty. And what are some of these? So if we think about um, the capacity to read nonverbal cues, this is critical for navigating social situations. Think of the person that you might know who's really awkward socially, who can't learn from feedback in social situations, or visual memory functions. These are critical for learning how to read, learning how to spell. If you think of a person that spells the same word multiple different ways on the same page, it may be a difficulty here or executive functions, which are really critical for thinking, for problem solving, for planning. And I describe this in my book as hitting the wall. This is the person that can't generate solutions to a problem, so they're constantly getting stuck in their problems. Or the capacity for recognizing faces to the ability to learn motor plans, which are really critical for writing. This is the individual that can tell you a beautiful story, but you put a pen in their hand and very little ends up going down on the page or to auditory memory functions involved in retaining information. So this is the person who has to scribble notes everywhere to remember what they're supposed to do, or the person that goes into the store after being asked to buy five items and comes home with only three and has no recollection that they were missing to, or the person who doesn't like audiobooks because they don't really retain information from listening, or the child that comes home and knows they have homework, but they can't remember what the teacher has asked them to do or understanding number and quantity. And this is really critical for time scheduling. So the person that's always running late or budgeting, the person that's always running out of money or even time signature in music is related to this function. Or then the capacity for grasping relationships. This is critical for comprehension, for cause and effect. And this was one of the difficulties that I had growing up and it led to a lack of understanding of my world or to reasoning spatially. This is critical for navigating, for being able to read maps, or even to do things like uh, geometry or geography where there's spatial relations. So again, I encourage people to try that cognitive questionnaire to get an idea of what might be going on in terms of their learning profile. And what does a cognitive approach to understanding learning entail? Uh, the next slide 
looks at 19 different cognitive functions. Um, and these are building blocks, fundamental building blocks that every time we learn, they come together. So when we read, these nine areas come together. And this is why the reading is very complicated. And when you see somebody that's been identified as having dyslexia, it could be any one of these cognitive functions or a combination of them. So this is why we have to go under the label because we don't want to be working on an area that may not be a difficulty for that individual. So what are, is one of these cognitive functions? The next slide looks at symbol recognition, which is a critical function related to reading. So some uh, researchers call this the brain's letterbox. Uh, another research, researcher calls this the visual word form area. This is the, the part of the brain that holds visual symbol patterns. So if you wanna kind of try a little test, you can think of the word cat, you can close your eyes and see, can you see that word projected up on a blackboard? Now you can open your eyes and how did you do? Some of you will have seen it really clearly, others it may be fuzzy. And a lot of the students who work with that have reading difficulties will just see the blank screen or the back of their eyelids because they can't hold the visual image. And the next slide looks at what it looks like if there's a strength here or an area of difficulty. So if there's a strength, this is the person that has photographic memory for text. The, the person that would have learned how to read very early, learned how to spell um, you know, exceptionally easily. If there's a difficulty here, this is the person that reads very slowly, that struggles to read, um, again, that will misspell words. So anything that involves learning uh, symbol patterns, even learning things like chemical equations or math formula visually will be a struggle. So what do we do if somebody has this difficulty? Um, the next slide shows a, an image of a student working on this exercise. So the students go through a process of visualizing and memorizing foreign symbol patterns because the idea is we want to stimulate and strengthen this cognitive function. And we use foreign symbols because we want to min minimize compensation. If we use English, the student could put sound to it. They might be able to put meaning to it. We want to target that specific cognitive function. And that's the basis of all of the cognitive programs is to target and work and strengthen a very specific cognitive function. And after the student works through this process, memorizing symbol patterns from multiple different languages, what we see are improvements in spelling and word recognition, in reading speed, and all aspects of visual symbol matching improve. And then what about the student that has a nonverbal learning difficulty? So this is the individual who struggles with nonverbal interpretation of situations, the person that's socially awkward. One researcher called this area cognitive Goldilocks, because this is the part of the brain that allows us to project ourselves into a situation before getting into that situation and creating a plan and creating a plan to decide how do I wanna behave in that situation? What outcome do I want from that situation? And then to weigh the pros and cons of acting in a certain way. And then once they get into the situation to start reading the nonverbal cues to see if they're getting the outcome that they want. So this is a critical um, component of emotional intelligence. And if somebody has difficulty here, they do what I call premature closure. <clears throat> They will look at a picture like this, the, if we go back to the previous slide, um, and they don't fully take in all of the information. So I showed this to a 12 year old girl who had a lot of social difficulties and asked her to tell me what was happening in this picture. And she looked at it, looked at me, and she told me they were playing badminton. Um, and it's sort of hard to see, but the, the woman who has her arms outstretched uh, has netting on her hat. And this is a fairly significant um, example of this premature closure. The young girl looked at the picture, looked at the netting on the hat, and it triggered an association of a badminton net. Now, clearly they're not playing badminton, but she didn't actively survey all of the information before making an interpretation. So imagine what her social relations were like. In fact, in the neighborhood that she grew up in, she had a, a reputation of um, people thought she was lying all the time or making up tall tales. And none of the other children wanted to play with her because 
she wasn't lying and she wasn't making up tales. She just interpreted the world very differently because of her nonverbal um, problem. We worked on this cognitive area and she now is in her 30s and has no difficulty interpreting and navigating the social world. But imagine if somebody has this difficulty, how they struggle with social relations. The, the next slide shows what it can look like if there's a strength or a weakness in this cognitive function. So if someone's strong here, this is a really good negotiator because this is the person that can read moment by moment um, social cues as the situation is evolving and modify their behavior appropriately, uh, again, to get the outcome that they want out of that social situation. If somebody has a difficulty here, they do that premature closure or leap before looking, they jump into a situation without taking in all of the information and we'll get into social difficulties um, and are very, very awkward. They also don't learn from social feedback. They, they can't pick up the cues, so they can't use those cues to modify their behavior. And we have programs that can work on this cognitive function to strengthen this part of the brain. And the outcome is moving from these areas of weakness, these struggles in social interaction, to being able to navigate effectively the social world and to build and develop very uh, positive and effective social relations. And so what are some of the other areas that we can work on? These are some of the common diagnostic um, labels. So dyslexia, you know, the, the impacts reading, dysgraphia, which impacts writing, dyscalculia, which is math, auditory memory, visual memory, auditory processing, executive functioning, reasoning, and, and attentional problems. Because a lot of times uh, it is our brain that regulates attention. As we strengthen um, specific cognitive functions, it has an impact on the brain's ability to regulate and maintain focus and attention. So again, if somebody comes into the program with one of these diagnostic categories, we can absolutely benefit the individual by going under the label, understanding for that person, what are the cognitive capacities that we need to strengthen. And as one parent said many years ago, school is just a metaphor for life. And these problems, if not addressed, will follow the individual through life. So what might the outcomes look like for a capacity-based approach uh, designed to enhance and strengthen and improve cognitive functions? Uh, the next slide just is kind of a summary of some of the, the research. If people are interested, again, on the Eaton Arrowsmith website and on our website, there's um, the, the research listed, uh, the actual individual studies, their videos of researchers talking about the research, and there are a couple of summary documents. So I, I welcome people to go into the research. Um, there's a global research initiative comprised of researchers uh, from universities in Canada, from the United States, and from Spain. And we are speaking, in fact, I spoke to a researcher today from uh, UCLA. So we're, we're constantly uh, doing research and we welcome, if there are any researchers listening tonight, uh, to join us in our initiative. So what is the imaging data telling us about the <clears throat> brains of individuals with learning difficulties? So this image is uh, showing the brains of adolescents and this is adolescents without learning difficulties. Uh, and these are connections within and between networks. And these are really critical networks that are necessary for uh, learning, for understanding our world. And this is what the connectivity looks like if one doesn't have a learning difficulty. The next slide shows what it looks like if one has a learning difficulty. And it's a very different pattern. Um, and what the research is showing us is a pattern of hyperconnectivity and underconnectivity. And the hypothesis is that the hyperconnectivity is a compensation for the underperforming or underfunctioning areas. So what happens is there, there are areas of difficulty or weakness, and then the brain compensates um, by strengthening the connectivity in other areas to try to do the job of those underconnected areas. But it really can't because the, the brain isn't designed to, um, to be able to do that. So what happens is, which is very similar to the experience of a child with learning difficulties, is working really, really hard, but not terribly effectively. And that is what is going on in the brain. It's a brain that's, that's uh, working incredibly hard, 
but not effectively because those areas can't really do the job of the underperforming areas. And as I mentioned earlier, this often leads to attentional problems. The brain of a student with learning difficulties gets exhausted and it starts to wander and lose focus. And as we strengthen these cognitive capacities, we strengthen the brain's ability to focus and to attend and the student no longer has attentional problems. So what are some of the connectivity changes that we're seeing as students uh, work through the program? And we're seeing this after the 10 month uh, you know, academic year program, and also after the six to eight week cognitive intensive program. And we call it a cognitive intensive program because we've taken the number of hours that we do over 10 months and we compress them into six to eight weeks. So it is incredibly intense. And both uh, programs are showing the overall effect is to strengthen the underconnected areas and then it allows those hyperconnected areas to reduce. So what's happening is the brain is starting to normalize. Like it's not, it's, it's starting to work and process efficiently and effectively. And we're seeing this in really critical networks. The next slide shows the different networks that we're seeing um, strengthening in connectivity. And these networks are important to a whole range of aspects of learning. So the default mode network is kind of, you know, that, that I'm thinking, I'm observing, I'm reflecting. The dorsal attention is what it sounds like, it's attention, kind of the paying attention to what's going on. The salience network is really important, which is asking what's important, what's critical, what's relevant, what should I really be paying attention to? And then the executive control network is that active mental initiative. How should I respond appropriately in the situation? And what we're seeing is students go through both the 10 month program and that six to eight week program are improvements in all of these networks and they're critical for um, thinking, planning, problem solving, making decisions, um, cognitive control, working memory, which is the ability to hold and manipulate information in one's mind in order to perform tasks, critical for comprehension, for memory, uh, for empathy, for the ability to take the perspective of another, to put ourselves into somebody else's shoes, uh, for self-awareness, for mental initiative, for efficiency of processing. And one of the researchers talks about why processing efficiency in the brain is really important. Uh, and she says that we don't want to always have to be doing maximal effort in our brains. It's just like our muscles. If your brain is fit and accomplished at a task, you should be able to dial it down and that frees your cognitive resources to do other things. So a brain that's processing efficiently and effectively is one of the outcomes of this work. And one of the young adult students, I think, summarized it very well in terms of how these changes in the brain played out in his life. He said, I began to organize my thoughts more efficiently and effectively and to plan ahead first a few weeks ahead, then a few months ahead. For the first time in my life, I had real long-term goals and was able to take steps towards achieving them. And this student, uh, after a year in the program, uh, he was a young adult, went on to finish a four-year degree in uh, design, and then he came second in the world in designing a racing car. So that activation in these networks is really critical and beneficial to all aspects of learning. It improves the overall capacity of the individual to learn. So instead of compensating and working around the difficulties, the program strengthens the underperforming cognitive areas and then learning proceeds efficiently and effectively and actually with joy. So how do these brain changes play out into the real world? So we see critical cognitive capacities improve. And these are three different studies, one done at the University of Calgary, one at the University of British Columbia, and one at Southern Illinois University. And using the Woodcock-Johnson, looking at their uh, cognitive abilities tests, and all of these cognitive abilities changed at a significant level as students went through the program. All of them changed over the 10 month academic program and all of the areas that are highlighted changed over the uh, six to eight week cognitive intensive program. And again, if people are interested, there are two published articles, one in the journal Learning and Research and Practice and the other that was just published uh, this summer, Applied Neuropsychology uh, Child. So again, I encourage people to uh, 
look at these studies, but really important cognitive abilities. So the brain has changed, it's led to more efficient cognition, processing speed improvements, fluid reasoning, attention, auditory processing, working memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, all of really critical cognitive abilities that are necessary for all aspects of learning. And then how does this play out academically? Again, um, the, the three universities did studies using uh, the Woodcock-Johnson academic measures. And it's really important to recognize that these students in these three different studies were only doing one period of mathematics and one period of English a day. That was all of the academics they were getting. The other six periods, they were working on cognitive programs. And with that limited amount of exposure to academic um, curriculum, all of these areas improved at a significant level. So word reading, word recognition, reading speed, comprehension, spelling, mathematics in a number of ways, computation, uh, conceptual quantitative concepts, math fluency, written expression, written fluency, all of these improved because we had changed the brain, which changed cognition, which led to improvements in academic performance. And there was um, a teacher in a school in um, somewhere in the United States, South Carolina, who talked about, you know, she said, there's something about Aerosmith. It makes students excited to learn new things. What I think it does is it gives them the cognitive competence and cognitive resources to be really successful at learning new things, which then makes them excited about learning new things. And then what are we seeing in terms of parent observations of students going through the program? This was research presented at the Society for Neuroscience Conference in Chicago a couple of years ago. And these are parents of students that, again, were in the cognitive intensive program. The blue is um, before the program and the orange is after. So they're seeing significant change in their, their children's ability to comprehend, to understand concepts. Uh, engagement looked at things like focus, attention, and mental initiative in the learning process. Their use of language, including vocabulary, emotional intelligence significantly uh, improved, and then school performance um, improved. So not only are the students showing improvement on cognitive measures, but parents are observing these cognitive changes in their children. And then what about social emotional improvements? Um, this was research done at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and what they found was students as they went through the program reported a greater sense of happiness and well being, which is really important. They reported an increased sense of locus of control because they now viewed themselves as agents of change in their life as they improved their cognitive abilities. Uh, they saw an increase in incremental theory of mind, which is Carol Dweck's work, um, which is around having an open mindset and a belief that your intelligence isn't fixed, which you can't be in a program that's driving neuroplastic change in your brain and believing your intelligence is fixed. They saw an increase in social skills, adaptability, leadership, uh, an increase in attention, listening well, staying focused, and a reduction in feelings of depression, anxiety, and to me, what was also really interesting, they measured cortisol through saliva. The students really liked this because they got to spit uh, at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study. And they found a reduction in cortisol and the stress hormones. So there, we're seeing changes in the brain. We're seeing improvements in cognition. We're seeing improvements in academic performance. We're seeing um, observable behavioral changes. And the body physiologically is responding uh, in a reduction in cortisol, which is a stress hormone, because these students are feeling better about themselves because they're experiencing real success and real competence in their learning experience. And then what are the researchers kind of saying in, in summary about this research? So at the University of British Columbia, to me, the, the critical thing that they're saying here is the capacity to learn new things is what is changing. Things like working memory, attention, and learning, which are important cognitive skills for success in school and in life. And then the researchers at the University of Calgary were saying, actually, if we strengthen the cognitive functions, it improves reading, mathematics, and writing by targeting the cause, which is the cognitive difficulty, rather than the symptoms. And then at Southern Illinois, 
the researchers are saying there is neuroplasticity of, as a function of the Aerosmith training, which improves performance. So precise cognitive exercises do activate and functionally change areas or networks of the brain. So again, the, the, what I postulated many, many years ago is change the brain, change cognitive functioning, change learning, change social emotional well-being, which changes one's reality and transforms one's future. And the research is demonstrating that. And then what are we seeing for students not identified with learning difficulties? So this was a study, two studies done uh, in Madrid, in Spain. Um, and then these are students that were doing the reasoning or the symbol relations um, program. Uh, first they started in grade three and then they moved it down into grade one. And just 40 minutes a day, five days a week, these students were doing one of the cognitive exercises and they saw significant gains in visual spatial ability, attention and executive functioning in the grade three and then the grade one visual spatial numerical ability. And this was presented uh, at a conference in Prague this past uh, summer, this past July. So again, students with learning difficulties can benefit and all students can benefit. This is putting the brain in the education equation. If we have a brain, we can enhance cognitive functioning. And then there's a school in Washington state um, that decided to offer the reasoning program as an elective um, for students in grades six, no, grades eight to grade 11. Uh, and these were this, the changes that students reported. They found improvement in reading comprehension, being able to read faster and make connections, to be able to write and take notes uh, with greater clarity. They could grasp math concepts. They made fewer careless errors. They could figure out steps in math. And in general learning, they felt that they became more attentive and focused and observant, more self-disciplined, uh, faster at completing homework, and they felt they were more prepared for college. And also they used uh, standardized tests as well, and they saw improvements on uh, the California Achievement Test and the measure of academic progress in vocabulary, reading comprehension, math concepts, and problem solving. So again, on standardized measures, these students showed significant gains and they themselves reported these significant gains. So what is Aerosmith, just to kind of in a, in a nutshell, is targeted cognitive programs uh, using really solid principles from uh, neuroscience. So this concept of differential stimulation, which just means we need to target that cognitive function, just like we looked at that exercise for the visual memory, where we're targeting and strengthening and exercising the specific cognitive function. Effort for processing just means that we have to keep the, the, the engagement and calibrate the level of difficulty of the activity. So it's, it's kind of like a physical workout for the brain. And this leads to structural and functional changes in the brain, which leads to increased cognitive capacity, improved ability to learn, which flows into increased social and emotional well-being and increased academic and career success. So what is my vision for this work? It's really, um, you know, the cognitive transformation is a normal part of the journey of education. And this is certainly what they do at Eaton Aerosmith, that every student has the opportunity to achieve their full potential with access to academic learning and cognitive enhancement. And to me, it is through cognitive transformation that we unlock each individual's gift, which allows them to dare to dream. And it's not only can they dare to dream, but they now have the cognitive resources and the cognitive capacity to be effective in realizing their dreams. And what are some of the faces of this dream? The next slide just shows some of the, the students. Um, you can see the, the face masks in the COVID era uh, and some of the online learning, but these are students working on this program. And as one mother summarized up this work, which really in one sentence, uh, kind of summarizes all of what I've said. She said, my, my daughter now uses her own brain to do things where before she was borrowing mine. Um, so I just wanna thank you for listening. And I wanna turn this back over to uh, Sandra and here are some resources if people are interested. Uh, Howard, who uh, introduced me, he's written two books, Brain School and the Brain Pioneer excellent, excellent reads. And he's very generously uh, put them on his website. And they're also on our website that you can download. They're, they're really 
um, excellent, excellent books. Uh, my book, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain, uh, Norman Doidge's book, The Brain That Changes Itself, The Work of Aerosmith is chapter two, and then our, our research summary. So just really encourage um, people to go in and do kind of a dive into these resources and to learn more at Eaton Aerosmith. I would just encourage people to uh, email. It's an incredible, incredible, incredible group of people uh, out there on the West Coast um, engaged in transforming the lives of all of their students. So thank you and back to Sandra. Thank you, Barbara. I am going to be showing my face in just a second. <laughs> there we go. There. Thank you so much for all of your words. And you know, I've been with Eaton Aerosmith since we began 18 years ago when we brought your incredible work out west and not a day goes by that I'm not grateful for the impact that this program has, not only on just students who are struggling in school, no matter, or adults, but really we could all benefit from this work. There's no one that couldn't benefit from enhancing their brain's capacity. And I know one of the struggles early on was people would phone and say, well, I don't live anywhere you know, near your school. How can we access this work? And you know, at the time I didn't have a really good answer, but through strange circumstances that have been the last couple of years through COVID, we're grateful for the quick action of the Aerosmith program and enabling this program now to be offered online as well. And so I thought what we would do next is uh, We'll turn it over to one of my favorite students ever. Her name is Elaine, and she's with us at Eaton Aerosmith School Online. And she'd like to share some of her experiences with Barbara's work with all of you. She's going to keep her camera off, but Elaine, if you can hear me, you can unmute yourself, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra. Can you hear me okay? We can. Great. Good evening, everyone. I'm Elaine, and I was asked to talk about the changes I've noticed in myself as a result of working on selected Aerosmith program exercises. I was asked because I'm several times older than many current Aerosmith students. I'm 68 with learning disabilities that remained undiagnosed until just over a year ago. I started working on the Aerosmith program in May of 2020 when it became available to me online. I'm remaining off camera because I don't like being the focus of visual attention. Some of what follows stirs up pretty strong emotions in me. If I were visible, it would make me even more nervous and tongue-tied than I already am. To keep my presentation within my time allotment, I'm going to read what I've prepared rather than speaking off the cuff. And I notice that my chair is squeaky, I apologize. Here are several ways that I've noticed that the Aerosmith program has impacted my life. I'll start with ability changes, followed by personality changes. I'll conclude with a follow-up statement. Number one, I'm left-handed and have become more dexterous with my right hand by working on symbol relations. Two, naturally, I'm much more an auditory than visual person. The Aerosmith program has made me more visually observant, and I notice things visually sooner than I used to. Three, disruptive noises distract me less than they used to. They used to be practically impossible for me to filter out, so they interrupted my concentration much of the time. There's been big improvement, even though I still have a long way to go. And finally, the biggie of the ability changes. It's the reason I wanted to start work on the Aerosmith program in the first place. What a difference it would have made in my life had I had it years ago, or decades ago. Number four, I've become less dyslexic. That means I make many fewer reversals of letters, syllables, words, partial lines of print, and numbers than I used to, especially during silent reading. And it's, it's so huge, it's making me choke up here. I don't have to waste time as much or as much time reshuffling the information back into the right order and rereading it to understand its meaning. It means my reading is smoother and faster now, allowing me to remember more easily what I'd read earlier in the book. 
Reading is more a pleasure now than a struggle, which makes me want to read more. Now, at the risk of exceeding my time allotment, I think it's important to add that this change alone has been, to me, worth the expense, time, and effort I have expended. The other changes, despite being fabulous, are simply bonuses. As far as impact on my personality goes, I've noticed several things. Number one, I've come to realize how patient I can be when needed and how determined and persistent I am when I'm working towards a goal that's important to me. Physically, I'm a slowpoke, but I'm okay with taking as much time as I need, even if I greatly exceed others' expectations and the time other students take to do the same thing. One of these days, I will master eight-handed clocks and hopefully 10-handed as well. Number two, I've become less serious. I see the humorous side of situations so much more than I used to. I laugh a lot more, although it doesn't seem like it right now. I'm also more able to recognize teasing, so I'm less gullible and less likely to be hoodwinked. Three, I'm less uptight and rigid, more relaxed and able to go with the flow than I used to be. Because I'm no longer drowning in a sea of confusion, I don't feel the need to be in control so that I can just keep my head above water. I used to. Number four, I'm less fearful that others will judge me negatively. So my confidence has increased. And number five, I've become a happier, more contented person overall, thanks to the Aerosmith program. And the last thing I'd like to add is that I'm very grateful to Barbara for creating her program and making it available to help others. I promote the Aerosmith program whenever and wherever I can. I believe in its ability to improve people's lives by remediating the root causes of their cognitive functioning issues. I even wrote a letter to both our provincial premier and our minister of education to promote it. I asked that the provincial government do all it can to make the Aerosmith program available in all primary schools to give each student the best start possible to their formal education. Failing that, I'd like the government to make access to the program easier for the parents of those students that the regular school system can't help enough. So far though, I haven't received a reply from either recipient, but I hope to before long. So there you have it, the perspective of an older student of the Aerosmith program on its value in and impact on her life. I hope that hearing it has been helpful to at least one of those who listened. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, I just wanna say, you got me in tears, Elaine. Uh, just an amazing transformation story and congratulations for what you've done and your work. And I'm sure Barbara, I'm sure Barbara feels the same over in Toronto. It was just amazing story, Elaine, thank you. Thank you, Howard. Elaine, we're so very proud of you. It takes great courage to do what you've done. And believe me, you have touched more than one life tonight by those words. Thank you. I don't know, Barbara, if you have anything you'd like to add. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it just takes me a moment to unmute and, yeah, <laughs> and do all that. But yeah, I mean, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, Elaine. I mean, just listening to you, I could relate because some of the very similar experiences that 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 I had, um, you know, with my struggles and challenges, and and really thank you for your courage, um, because I know what courage it takes to talk about, you know, one's uh, experience and one's challenge and being being vulnerable and and being courageous. So so. Thank you. I just want to honor that. And as Sandra said, by your um, talking and sharing your story, it will touch and transform the lives of, of other people. So uh, thank you for having the courage to share your story. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again, Elaine. And along with our online programs, we certainly have programs running in our schools in Vancouver and White Rock and in Redmond, Washington. And we're so pleased to have join us, Arian. And if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, you please call me to task. 
But we're so grateful for you to be here to share your story from a parent perspective. And I will give the floor to you now. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, I guess, in English pronounced Aryan or Aryan. Uh, um, originally from Holland. I've been living here for about 20 years um, in this area. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still parsing Elaine's story, um, honestly, uh, because, you know, I think a lot about my kid and how does it help? And we'll get in a second to that point. But while doing that, while going to so many tests, answering so many questions from so many different places to help him, I also discovered that I start answering some of these questions in ways that would trigger things. So um, I've been since the last couple of months that my son has been in the program here, I've been even thinking myself, like, should I do one of these after school programs, these evening programs? And I think Elaine just convinced me to go for it. So um, that's something I'll, uh, and I'll, have, I'll have to talk to Tracy and, uh, and commit to this, but I do think I, I really want to do this. Uh, but now back to <laughs> being the parent. Um, I was on, um, you know, for a while, we didn't notice it. As parents, for a son, we didn't really notice it. But he struggled at some point with language, and he started struggling with attention. And at some point in school, the first and second grade, it was brought to our attention that he, um, he could use some help. So we went through the normal process and, and the test. And out of that came um, a diagnosis of ADSD. Um, as well as, uh, as uh, learning difficulties around uh, language. And um, so with that, we uh, had to make a lot of decisions quickly. And um, somebody suggested to us a program for language uh, that helped with language it was actually in, in, in a way similar. It went to the root causes of parts of the brain and trying to help train these pieces to help with language concepts. And um, so we took our son for four months out of school at noon, drove him to this other place. Uh, there's a very, very intensive program, but four months later, um, things changed so much at that point. And we're like, wow, we had no idea this was possible, but he did this. He started reading books by himself, which he didn't do. And he had all these, these changes in that. And um, to quote his teacher, this is second grade, she called us up and said, hey, I just wanna let you know, he tested as a fifth grade level on reading. And so we're like, wow, this is impossible. And uh, why do I mention this first before we get to the other, to, to um, Aerosmith, is that, that before that, we were only told that, oh yeah, and you get a therapist and you get medication and there's all this. And if it wasn't for one specific person, it just brought up this program, I, we would not have gotten even to this point. Um, so we were very excited about this. He went to third grade, everything was fine. COVID hit and we went to online learning and our son struggled so much. And so we were mid fourth grade and we decided like, okay, we need to find another fourth, fifth grade solution. And then we discovered Aerosmith. And with the past experience, I didn't have to go read 20 reasons why I went straight in and said, okay, this, I, I wish I had known it's early. We went in and we found um, Ethan Aerosmith here in Redmond. Uh, our son went there for a day. He loved it. My wife and I uh, talked about it. that one night said, why are we even waiting till September? Let's just go for it. So we went in April. This April we went and it was three months in. And um, the changes that we saw, um, you know, even though they were sometimes subtle, they were right there. And this was all without anything else. It was just him going to Ethan Aerosmith, which he also loves as a, as a place, as a community to be but he picked up on so many things. Um, and I'll just highlight a couple of quick things. Clock reading. Now, people say kids have to learn how to read the clock. And at some point when you have, you know, a 10 year old who still doesn't really understand clocks, you start to worry. But it was not just about, can you tell me what the time is? It was the concept of time was just not there. Understanding that a movie is two hours and something else is 10 minutes, there was nothing. There was absolutely no understanding of it. And it's hindered his planning so much. He could not plan. You couldn't say, oh, let me do this quick thing because he was lost. Um, that has changed a lot. So before the summer vacation hit, so we're talking about two to three months, he was very different in that aspect. He started to really plan his day. He was, because of that, also a lot more confident because he was able to complete things um, you know, all by himself. 
he planned it. He had an understanding of time. He would finish something on time. It, it was, you, you saw him grow in ways. It was, it was quite amazing. Um, the other thing, going back to the ADHD diagnosis, and I think what we just saw in, in the presentation about this, um, executive functioning, um, holding attention, uh, emotional control. Um, there's no medication involved here. This is just him two, three months later showing that, um, showing subtle things about being able to not blow up when he's angry or get sad to scream out of, great if he's happy, but sometimes you know cannot be that loud, right? It's, it's, and, and I thought I'd mention about like, um, this mom said like, well, she's using her own brain now instead of mine. I think this connects so well. Like, I always felt like I always had to be with him. I started to worry in the future, like I can't always be with my son. I can't always remind him to focus on something, to complete something, or to maybe tone it down a little bit. He needs to learn it himself. And we are, again, right before the summer vacation, and I started to see bits and pieces of it. Now, that said, after the summer vacation, we'll have to, it felt like we had to start over a little bit back <laughs> and come back in, but that's just like any other training um i think but um we we just yeah i i don't know there is just uh, so far we love it um we've seen that, why do we love it as parents because we see our kid grow and the most important thing that it's taking away is that concern and i'm sure a lot of other parents have this as well you know our kids at some place leave the nest and need to care of themselves and this is not about what you learn in school and little bits it's about like how you function and that functioning that's that's what i think the aerosmith program is really helping with and i'm seeing it and Ethan aerosmith as a school in the redmond um i mean i'm so glad we live so close to redmond because i can totally understand parents listening today that are so far from these places but Online obviously is is there as well, but I you well know, we love it. We we're so happy with it, and the community is great. Not just teachers and students, but also the parents. The parents at uh, Ethan Aerosmith uh, here in Redmond they come together every I think every two weeks now, and we openly talk about our experiences, and that's such an extra thing that uh, I just want to mention because um, it just adds a lot of value being able to talk to other parents that understand this. So. Uh, but yeah, uh, probably went way over my time. <laughs> Just a, but, a, a thank you again for the story and thank you for commitment to, for your son for going through this uh, program. Of course, love to see you uh, engaged in it too. And, and thank you, Tracy and your team down there. Uh, I, I haven't been down there because of COVID for two years. And so I look forward to visiting one day and I don't know if you know the story, I'll be quick. Uh, Sacha and a new Nadella had their child in Vancouver. They were commuted, they had moved, Anu had moved the family to Vancouver so her kids could attend the school while Sacha was running uh, the Bing platform for Microsoft. And uh, we had a discussion and he said, could you bring a school to Redmond, Washington? So it would make travel less of a problem for me. And uh, he was very kind in helping me get the school down there. but. Uh, because of the Nadellas, the school is in Redmond. And because of Tracy and her team, the school thrives. And because of parents like you, uh, we exist. So, so thank you for the belief in us. Now, thank you for bringing it to us. Because again, I, I, I'll be lost right now if this program wasn't here, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. No, it, the, the support that you've, you've given your son is what we all dream of being able to give to our children. And, and, and in my role in admissions, it's the number one piece of information that is shared is, you know, I, I just want my child to come back to me to see the child that I know is possible and to have that independence available to him or her in the future and not worry that, you know, it does have to be my brain that is being borrowed. And I felt the same. My son went through Eaton Aerosmith in Vancouver for three years and you know, I knew when I first started to see, you know, this bright, uh, passionate boy starting to go down a path that, that led to a gap between him and his peers that um, if we stayed the course in a typical, you know, academic setting, that gap was only going to widen. And so by targeting and strengthening the capacity, we give our kids or adults give themselves that ability to have so, so many more possibilities for their future, independent of what we can provide. And 
I think that's what we all want for each other. So thank you again. And so now we do have some time as promised to have a bit of a question and answer session. So if you do have a question for us, please do put it in the chat. And I will say that if your question is more personal in nature regarding yourself or your specific child, let's hold on to those. And what we'll do is if you're interested in any particular information about Eden Aerosmith Vancouver or White Rock or our online programs, I know my colleague Rose will put my booking link in the chat and you can always uh, you know, book a time and we can have a really good conversation over the phone. And if you're interested in Eaton Aerosmith Redmond, then Tracy, if you'd like to put your email address in the chat there, you can always reach out to Tracy McCammon, our principal at Eaton Aerosmith Redmond. But feel free to ask questions in the chat and we'll get to them. And if you do have to leave, no worries at all. We completely understand, as I've mentioned before, this is being recorded and we'll send you out a copy uh, when we're all finished. So let's see, I think there's a question. Okay, it says, it's great to hear about the success stories, but could you share the instances when the program did not work and why? Great question. Um, I can take it in terms of admissions. Uh, that's why we have a screening process. And it's not really to screen anyone out, as we've talked about all of us. This program is really available to so many people, but they have to be at a time in their life when they're ready for it. Because as you can imagine, changing a physical body part in this way by enhancing the brain's capacity to learn it does take stamina. It does take being okay with accepting the feedback of your teacher, of your instructor, and doing the exercises in a very particular way. And sometimes students are just not ready for that. If students are very young, perhaps under the age of seven, developmentally, they may not be ready for that. And then, you know, all of us at different points in our lives, we might not be ready. So um, readiness is a really big piece. And sometimes, you know, if there is a student who, uh, you know, does start and does feel that, you know, it's just too much for them at a particular part, point in time, then we may say, let's take a break and carry on in the future. But essentially anyone that, that we feel is a very good fit for this program and, you know, parents or adults themselves feel the same way. Um, I really in 18 years cannot think of anyone who did not achieve you know, cognitive benefit from this program. It's a good question though. Anyone else have a question for us? Oh, good question. Okay, so we've got, do the changes stick after the child is done with the program? That's a good one. Who can I pick on on my team to answer that? Um, why don't we ask Tracy that actually, since we've just been talking about Tracy McCann, our principal in Redmond. Tracy, what's your experience with that? Hi, everybody. Did the changes stick after the child is done with the program? Um, my answer to that is yes, that has been our experience. Uh, what happens is a student starts to apply their at their newly strengthened abilities in their everyday lives. And so they start taking on the exercise themselves in everything that they do, especially if they're in a learning environment where um, you know, they're, they're applying those skills and, and learning and it's just, the exercise just keeps going. So absolutely, and all of the experiences that I have seen um, students remain, um, um, strong in their cognitive abilities and, and efficient in their learning. Sure. Thank you, Tracy. All right, a question from Erin. Barbara, this one's for you. Mm -hmm. It says, hi, everyone. As a current neuroeducational doctoral student, I would love to hear Barbara talk about the importance of conceptual learning, which is a level above pattern-based learning. Are there cognitive exercises that lead students to creating conceptual ideas? Uh, yes, the, the exercise, the first one that I created for myself, which is the symbol relations, is all about concepts. Like it's the part of the brain that uh, attaches meaning to our, our perceptions, meaning to uh, basically our understanding of the, of the world. So it, it is fundamental to conceptual uh, grasp of information and ideas. It's that, that kind of that simultaneous 
uh, integration and synthesis of um, pieces of information to come together in a conceptual whole to say, aha, that's what that means to, to give insight. So, um, so that exercise absolutely is an underpinning of, um, you know, conceptual understanding in the brain and then ultimately in our world. And then there's also the programs that dr drive uh, the prefrontal cortex. So for executive functioning, um, which is really more for strategy, mental initiative, but also is related to uh, understanding like thinking, problem solving, strategizing. So those are sort of what we call the higher order cognitive functions. Um, so the programs for those areas absolutely are critical in uh, understanding and conceptual grasp of, of information. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, Tiana, I hope I, it's okay if I mention this, but I think Elaine would love to hear this. Elaine, a message from Tiana. I just wanted to thank Elaine, my daughter, age 10, and I both listened and had a good cry. I think it really helped her to understand why she's doing this extra work. She's one of our wonderful students at Eaton Aerosmith School Online. Thanks, Tiana. I'm sure that means a lot to Elaine. I don't see any more questions. Anyone else? If not, no worries. I do know it's getting late, and especially for Barbara out there in the East Coast, it's uh, getting past my bedtime anyway, probably yours as well. Uh, but certainly, as I said earlier, we're more than available here at Eaton Aerosmith to answer any questions, especially those that are more personal. So you can always email me at admissions at eatonaerosmith.com. It is in the chat or Tracy McCammett at tmccammett at eatonaerosmith.com. And again, that's in the chat as well. But a huge, huge thank you from all of us to you, Barbara, for sharing your words, for sharing your life's work as you do so graciously. And of course, to Elaine and to Ariane as well for sharing your personal stories. You don't know how much they mean to us to hear them. So thank you so much, all of you, and have a wonderful evening. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.